Picture yourself in one of these scenarios. You go shopping and your credit card transaction is denied despite the fact that you know you have money in your account. Or you go to an ATM machine and you're informed that your withdrawal request has been denied. You also discover that the government will be confiscating part of your deposits in order to stabilize the bank. You believe that this can't happen here because the FDIC protects your money. You may have placed your money into one of the big banks because it has large vaults and is protected by the government. You may have placed public monies into a large bank because they're collateralized and the government will back them. Therefore, you think these funds are safe. All of these assumptions are not based on the facts. Perhaps you recall that in Cyprus, depositors' money was confiscated in order to stabilize the banks. Similar plans are already in place to do the same in the U.S. and other countries. In a nutshell, the banks in Cyprus were over-leveraged to the point that their liabilities exceeded their gross domestic product. Because the global bailouts of large banks in 2008 were so politically unpopular, a global banking troika of the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, and the European Union imposed a bail-in in which bank customers were to have some of their savings seized in order to stabilize the banks. The losses to some clients were as high as 60%. Cyprus was the test run. Now that's where the European Union kind of let the cat out of the bag, what they planned to do on a bigger scale. But depositors took a real haircut. Interestingly though, of course, the big boys got out. In the days before, they went to, after depositors' money, you know, the small time saver, 150 million billion dollars, I forget the number, left the Cyprus banks because the insiders knew what was coming. And the insiders will know what's coming when the next U.S. bank burns down. They'll get out and they'll leave the mom and pop depositors and maybe city governments holding the bag. In order to protect themselves, the Cyprus government closed the banks 12 days and people had limited access to their money. Long lines formed at the ATM machine. The fact is, that the confiscations in Cyprus were not a one-time event. The eventuality for this had already been planned in advance, and there are plans in place for confiscations of depositor accounts in New Zealand, the European Union, Canada, England, and the United States. Not even me in my most pessimistic of speeches would have imagined, Mr. Wren, uh, that you and the others in the Troika would resort to the level of common criminals and steal money yeah. from people's bank accounts yeah. in order to keep propped up this total failure that is the, the euro. You even tried to take money away from the small investors in direct breach of the promise you made back in 2008. Well, the precedent has been set, and if we look at countries like Spain, where business bankruptcies are up 45% year on year, we can see what your plan is to deal with the other bailouts as they come. Uh, I must say, the message this sends out to investors is very loud and clear. Get your money out of the Eurozone before they come for you. What you have done in Cyprus is you, you've actually sounded the death knell of the euro, nobody in the international community will have confidence in leaving their money there. If the trillions printed so far by the European Central Bank have done any good, it's not obvious. Most of the continent is in recession and it's just getting worse. In some countries, unemployment is at depression levels. The ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. Most people took that to mean even more money printing. But Germany's powerful central bank regards monetary easing as sinful and potentially disastrous in the long run. So when banks in the tiny nation of Cyprus began to sink under their debts, Cypriots discovered they'd become the testing ground for a shocking new policy. 
On the 16th of March, the European Central Bank launched a bomb across the Mediterranean and it landed here. No longer, they declared, were they willing to fund bank bailouts the way they'd done in Spain and elsewhere. Either Cyprus's government agreed to confiscate its people's private bank accounts or the country would be left to strangle. Basically, the central bank had decided that Cyprus was not too big to fail. What can an ordinary person do when life's basic assumptions change? Chris Drake and David Simmons are amongst the many expatriates who moved here hoping to stretch their retirement savings just a bit further. Now I'm restricted as to what I can take out, what deals I can do. So we're being dictated to by these ECB, these European bankers, as to what we can do with our cash. Frankly, I have no idea what to do. Where are you safe anymore? Under the mattress. Your true wealth is your time and freedom. Money is just a tool for trading your time. It's a container to store your economic energy until you're ready to deploy it. But the whole world has been turned away from real money and has been fooled into using currency. A deceitful imposter that is silently stealing your two most valuable assets, your time and your freedom. We are entering a period of financial crisis that is the greatest the world has ever known. The wealth transfer that will take place during this decade is the greatest wealth transfer in history. Wealth is never destroyed, it is merely transferred, and that means that on the opposite side of every crisis there is an opportunity. If you learn what is going on and how the financial world works, you can put yourself on the correct side of this wealth transfer. Five years ago, the world was teetering on the edge of a financial precipice. Economies everywhere, led by the U.S., plunged to near disastrous levels not seen since the Great Depression. Huge corporations failed. Ordinary folks saw their retirement savings slashed. Virtually no one was spared. But out of the ashes of this meltdown emerged a savior. Stimulus. Cheap credit. Trillions of dollars of it made available by a super breed of cash managers, a select group of unelected officials with the staggering power to make the world go round. But they've also punished an entire generation. What they've done is take money from people who have been really careful all through their lives. In the process, They've also taken the entire world into the unknown by exercising a power that they alone possess, conjuring unimaginable amounts of cheap money. So the central bankers stepped in. First, they flattened interest rates. Then they began printing vast amounts of money. They called their program quantitative easing, and it did stop the meltdown. But you cannot unleash forces that powerful without provoking consequences, intended and unintended. A whole generation of Brits believed that if you saved and if you were prudent, you'd get a decent return on your savings someday. But in Britain, pension benefits are directly tied to interest rates on government bonds. And the British Central Bank's aggressive quantitative easing, its money printing, has depressed those interest rates to nearly nothing. This year, pensioners like Judy White and her husband Alan began to receive grim letters from their pension funds, notifying them of deep cuts to their benefits. I don't understand what quantitative easing is, except that it's printing money. But I do understand that I now have 50% less as a result of something called quantitative easing. One of the biggest make-believe stories ever is called quantitative easing, which sounds complex, but it's really just a smoke and mirrors term for currency creation. QE started with the banking bailouts back in 2009. This currency was created out of thin air and then given to the banks who paid themselves record bonuses in reward for crashing the world economy. This is a global phenomenon, but all you have to remember for now 
is that whether it's QE bailouts or stimulus programs, these are all just voodoo, hocus-pocus terms for increased currency creation. Punishing savers was a deliberate trade-off. The central bank wants to encourage spending and lending right now, not saving, even though foolish spending and lending caused the problem in the first place. It is hugely dangerous. This policy is a monumental monetary experiment. Roz Altman says the central bankers have in fact engineered a massive transfer of wealth from the old savers to young borrowers. The Bank of England itself says quantitative easing has cost savers and pensioners in Britain about $100 billion so far. So anybody who was a saver and has got some accumulated savings will have had a reduction in their income. Anyone who had big debts, particularly mortgage debts, will have had an improvement in their income position because their interest payments would have gone down. But the impact on savings and pensions is just one troubling result of quantitative easing. It's also created an addiction to cheap money. Governments now rely on it to finance their out-of-control borrowing and spending, and consumers have taken on a staggering amount of personal debt. Some economists compare the cheap money to crack cocaine, and they ask what will happen when the drug is taken away. Experts tend to agree that stock markets are at all-time highs, not because of vibrant growth or the performance of the companies, but because of all the cheap money flowing into Wall Street. And real estate is at nosebleed levels in places like Toronto, Vancouver, London, Berlin and New York City because of artificially low interest rates. Look, we're watching the long bond right now. It's at a three and a quarter. You're breaking through the technical highs. You can see Mark Grant watches it all from his mansion in Florida. He's something of a financial oracle. He advises some of the biggest investors in the world, and he says they know they're rising on a tide that is not real. But here's the problem. The underlying economy that would normally support this isn't there. So it's a false kind of uh, buoyancy, a false kind of tide that everybody's riding and everybody keeps playing. We have now the entire world in a bubble. Every asset class, everything you can think of, real estate, uh, the stock market, the debt market, everything is in a bubble and something is going to prick it. Okay, so... Grant was one of the first to blow the whistle on Greece and other Eurozone problems. He now issues constant warnings about quantitative easing. Just keep your eye on that. And what do you tell your clients? Be safe. <laughs> I tell them to be safe, be prepared, and fine play the equity markets, fine play the com compression in the bond markets, but be ready because you're going to have to move very quickly when this reverses. William Grider, who's made a career of writing about the U.S. Federal Reserve, agrees that the central bank's cure may turn out to be a disease. The more the Fed tries to help the real economy, the more it boosts the stock market. And so if you, if you listen to the bears, and I mean the market bears, they're already very nervous, not about inflation, but about the possibility that the stock market investors are going to wake up to this reality and say, I think I'll get off the merry-go-round before it collapses. Is there a good ending in all this? Probably not. There's less bad endings, but probably no good endings. In America, where the Federal Reserve is now printing $85 billion a month, politicians are telling the public that a recovery is underway so they can start spending again. That's a great misunderstanding, if not a, if not a uh, deliberate lie, that the economy has not come back. 
the central bankers are holding firm and holding together. Quantitative easing will clearly continue and interest rates will stay low, at least for now. It's like a doctor is trying a new medicine. The patient isn't recovering. Most doctors would then look for a different medicine, but this group is doubling the dose. And when that doesn't work, it's doubling the dose again. The trouble is, they've shown themselves capable of being wrong. Most of the economic forecasting by central banks in recent years has been well off the mark. There is nothing backing our money. This piece of paper is just a piece of paper. Where does this leave us? If money's based on nothing, why do we think it has any value? <laughs> Sorry? Because we can still go and exchange it. What? Well, somebody else was going to shout. Great little Latin fact. The word for credit comes from... <laughs> belief. <laughs> Correct. Have you ever wondered why there's so much debt? Or why the experts and authorities seem completely unable to solve the current debt crisis? Well, the reason they can't solve it is because they're trying to fix and repair the existing banking system. But the existing banking system is completely flawed. It's the existing system that has buried all of us under a massive mountain of debt. In the next three minutes, I'll show you how the design of the banking system guarantees that the vast majority of people will end up in debt and why allowing the banks to go back to business as usual would be the worst thing for the economy and for society as a whole. But first, where do you think all this debt came from? Many people would assume that a bank needs to get money from a saver before it can make a loan to a borrower. After all, isn't that what banks do? Taking money from people who want to save it and lending it to businesses and people who need to borrow. Well, not exactly. Here's a fact that not many people know. A bank doesn't actually need to have any real money before it can make a loan to someone. When you take out a mortgage from the bank, the bank doesn't take that money from somebody's grandma's life savings. No. Instead, they simply open up a computer and type some numbers into your account. You get a huge wad of money in your account and you also get a huge wad of debt that you'll be repaying over the next 25 years. But the money that you borrowed was created out of nothing and just typed into your account. Well, we know that's hard to believe. But you don't need to take our word for it. The Bank of England themselves say that when banks make loans, they create additional bank deposits for those that have borrowed the money. These bank deposits are just the numbers in your account. And Martin Wolf, the chief economics editor at the Financial Times, says that the essence of the contemporary monetary system is the creation of money out of nothing by private banks, often foolish lending. So almost all the money we use today is made in this way, out of nothing by banks when they make loans. And the only way that we as the public can get our hands on this money is to go into debt to the banks. In other words, almost every pound that we need in the economy to run shops, businesses, factories, schools and hospitals must first be borrowed by us from a high street bank. And if one person has a million pounds, the rest of us must be a million pounds in debt. If we try not to go into debt, then the banks would be unable to create money and the economy would grind to a halt. This is effectively a whole-scale privatisation of the power to create money. Historically, money creation was pegged to a commodity, often gold, but today it is pegged to nothing. Well, to protect his gold, the goldsmith needed a vault and soon his fellow townsmen were knocking on his door wanting to rent space to safeguard their own coins and valuables. Before long the goldsmith was renting every shelf in the vault and earning a small income from his vault rental business. Years went by and the goldsmith made an astute observation. Depositors rarely came in to remove their actual physical gold and they never all came in at once. That was because the claim checks the goldsmith had written as receipts for the gold were being traded in the marketplace as if they were the gold itself. This paper money was far more convenient than heavy coins, and amounts could simply be written instead of laboriously counted one by one for each transaction. Meanwhile, the goldsmith had another business. He lent out his gold, charging interest. 
Well, as convenient claim check money came into acceptance, borrowers began asking for their loans in the form of these claim checks instead of the actual metal. As industry expanded, more and more people asked the goldsmith for loans. This gave the goldsmith an even better idea. He knew that very few of his depositors ever removed their actual gold, so the goldsmith figured he could easily get away with lending out claim checks against his depositors' gold in addition to his own. As long as the loans were repaid, his depositors would be none the wiser and no worse off, and the goldsmith, now more banker than artisan, would make a far greater profit than he could by lending only his own gold. For years, the goldsmith secretly enjoyed a good income from the interest earned on everybody else's deposits. Now a prominent lender, he grew steadily richer than his fellow townsmen, and he flaunted it. Suspicions grew that he was spending his depositors' money. His depositors got together and threatened withdrawal of their gold if the goldsmith didn't come clean about his newfound wealth. Contrary to what one might expect, this did not turn out to be a disaster for the goldsmith. Despite the duplicity inherent in his scheme, his idea did work. The depositors had not lost anything. Their gold was all safe in the goldsmith's vault. Well, rather than taking back their gold, the depositors demanded that the goldsmith, now their banker, cut them in by paying them a share of the interest. And that was the beginning of banking. The banker paid a low interest rate on deposits of other people's money that he then loaned out at a higher interest. The difference covered the bank's cost of operation and its profit. The logic of this system was simple, and it seemed like a reasonable way to satisfy the demand for credit. However, this is not the way banking works today. Our goldsmith banker was not content with the income remaining after sharing the interest earnings with his depositors and the demand for credit was growing fast as Europeans spread out across the world. But his loans were limited by the amount of gold his depositors had in his vault. That's when he got an even bolder idea. Since no one but himself knew what was actually in his vaults, he could lend out claim checks on gold that wasn't even there. As long as all the claim check holders didn't come to the vault at the same time and demand real gold, how would anyone find out? This new scheme worked very well, and the banker became enormously wealthy on the interest paid on gold that did not exist. The idea that the banker would just create money out of nothing was too outrageous to believe, so for a long time the thought did not occur to people. But the power to just invent money went to the banker's head, as you can well imagine. In time, the magnitude of the banker's loans and his ostentatious wealth did trigger suspicions once again. Some borrowers started to demand real gold instead of paper representations. Rumors spread. Suddenly, several wealthy depositors showed up to remove their gold. The game was up. A sea of claim check holders flooded the street outside the closed doors of the bank. Alas, the banker did not have enough gold and silver to redeem all the paper he had put into their hands. This is called a run on the bank, and it is what every banker dreads. This phenomenon of a run on the bank ruined individual banks and, not surprisingly, damaged public confidence in all bankers. It would have been straightforward to outlaw the practice of creating money from nothing. But the large volumes of credit the bankers were offering had become essential to the success of European commercial expansion. So instead, the practice was legalized and regulated. Bankers agreed to abide by limits on the amount of fictional loan money that could be lent out. The limit would still be a number much larger than the actual value of gold and silver in the vault. Quite often the ratio was nine fictional dollars to one actual dollar in gold. In 1971, President Nixon took the United States off the gold standard. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. Meaning the dollar could no longer be converted to gold. Since then, the world has operated under a system of money called fiat currency. The dollar, pound, euro, and every currency in the world are all fiat. 
Fiat currency is paper currency that a government has declared to be legal tender but can't be redeemed for gold or silver. Fiat money is essentially nothing more than a piece of paper worth something only because the government says it is. Its only value comes from the good faith by the people that use it, to accept it as payment. The problem with a fiat system is that the government is free to print as much money as they want without the burden of finding gold to support the amount they're creating. Since the collapse of the dollar gold standard in 1971 and the deregulation of the financial system, money creation has grown exponentially. Thus they can create billions out of thin air and pump it into circulation, making the money already out there worth less and less. But history has taught us that no fiat currency lasts forever. In fact, every currency since China first experimented with it in the 11th century has failed. So if no fiat currency has stood the test of time, why would it be different here in the United States? According to a study of 775 fiat currencies by DollarDays.org, the average life expectancy for a fiat currency is 27 years. 599 of these are no longer in circulation. Some have only taken a month to crash. Others have taken centuries. Here's how those currencies died. 20% of these failed through hyperinflation, a phenomenon where printing too much money leads to prices rising by 50% or more each month. 21% were destroyed by war, in which currency was deemed no longer valid through military occupation or liberation. 12% of these were destroyed by independence, in which former colonial entities renamed or reformed their currency. 24% of these were reformed through monetary unions such as the euro in 1999 or the creation of the US dollar in 1792. Finally, 23% of these are still alive, but they're all running quickly down the path to death. The two longest running currencies are British pound and the US dollar, but since its creation, the British pound has lost 99.5% of its value. As for the US dollar, from 1971 to 2008, the amount of dollars in circulation increased by 17 times. This has resulted in an 81% fall in purchasing power. Ever wonder why all those goods and services cost more now than they did when you were younger? Now you know. The US has all the characteristics of other currencies that have collapsed in history. Right now we are at war. And financing this expensive war results in monetary inflation. Currently, the United States owes more than $15 trillion in debt. And historically speaking, when a country has gotten itself into huge debt, its answer has always been to make more money. Perhaps the U.S. monetary system is headed toward complete failure like currencies before it. If so, what comes next? In the past several years, I've, I've spoken in many countries about the crisis that's coming. And a lot of people think that they're going to be okay in their country, that it's only going to happen to the United States or maybe the United States in Europe. Uh, but what they don't realize is that this is a global phenomenon. I've got to show you something here. This is a base currency in the United States. This is the number of paper dollars that exist, basically. It took 200 years to go from no dollars in existence to 825 billion. And then we had the bailouts, and then we had QE1, quantitative easing, one, then QE2, and then we had QE3, and then QE4, and then soon we're going to have QE57 and QE382. <laughs> and uh, it isn't just here. This is what the Canadian currency supply looks like. This is Australia, South Africa, Russia. Now, this starts out in just the year 2001, and this is like 18 times more currency in existence in a little over a decade. India, China, every government on the planet is doing this insane deficit spending and expanding their currency supplies, uh, doing bailouts, and history shows that th there is no example of this turning out well. If you expand the currency supply, eventually prices will rise. And if you contract the currency supply, 
eventually prices will fall. This is a pool, but it's not a pool of water. This is a, the currency pool, and these are prices. And if you expand the currency supply, prices like a sponge in water have to rise to suck up the excess currency. Governments never stop printing more currency and adding currency to circulation. Therefore, prices keep on going up, not because the stuff that you're trying to buy is changing. The real estate doesn't change. What has changed is the currency purchases less and less. It's the currency going down, not prices going up. Uh, you took over the Fed in, in 2006. I have a, a silver ounce here. And this, this ounce of, uh, of silver back in 2006 would buy over four gallons of gasoline. Today, today it'll buy almost 11 gallons of gasoline. That's preservation of value, and that's what, that's what the market has always said should be money. M money comes into effect in a natural way, not in a, an edict, not by fiat, by governments declaring it, it, is, it is money. If they keep expanding the money supply so vastly, why aren't our prices growing faster than they really are? And the answer is that a good chunk of the money that the Fed created has been shipped overseas. Uh, I remember early in my research, I heard this expression that the Americans have exported their inflation. I thought, what is that? How can you export your inflation? Put it in a box and send it out? What do you do? Well, now I understand you export your inflation by simply sending all these dollars that you created to these other countries, and then they send you their refrigerators and their cars and whatever, their TV sets. So you get hardware, and they get little pieces of paper. It's a great deal for the American people for a while. For a while. Sooner or later, all of those pigeons come home to roost. When the time comes, as it looks like it's now coming, when the rest of the world is saying, uh-uh, we don't want to play this game anymore. Uncle Sam's dollars are just becoming worthless. There are too many of them. We've got to find something else other than American dollars. Then those dollars start to come back to America. People say, we don't want them anymore. What do we do with them? Once this revs up and we've got this, uh, this little trickle of money coming back that we previously exported, when, once it becomes a flood, and it starts to rush back, now we are getting our former exported inflation brought back to us, and then we'll see the quantity of money inside the United States grow much more rapidly, even than the Federal Reserve can create it, because we're getting a previous money back. And uh, that's when we will really see the tanking of the U.S. dollar in terms of what it will buy. The thing about money is there actually is a fairly well accepted definition of what money is. The question is, as you apply that definition to particular things that, are, that people claim to be money, do they fit the definition? Well, just take the paper dollar, for example. How well does it perform those functions? Well, store of value. Uh, the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power uh, since the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. So, not very good as a store of value. It keeps governments under control. You can maintain a solvent system. Governments don't like gold at present because they're getting away with the fiat currencies and they'll do everything they can to discredit it as an asset class. I mean, my goodness, gold has uh, outperformed the Dow Jones Industrial Average in each of the last seven years, uh, yet it's not considered a legitimate asset class. Why? Again, it's the fear that maybe gold will be imposed on the system, that it will constrain government ability to spend beyond its means. They can't print it. They can't print it, no. It's not the price of gold and silver that's changing. It's the value of the paper currencies that they're being valued in. Yeah. I mean, gold and silver have been constants for centuries. And, you know, they're, they come and go, paper currencies come and go, and as you know, every single experiment in paper, fiat paper currency in history has ended disastrously. 
And with all evidence what's going on this, we're going to have a similar occurrence this time. Yeah, what I like to do is I like to use examples so people stop thinking in terms of dollars and start thinking in terms of gold and silver. And one of my favorite stories is that when I was uh, growing up in the 1950s in the States, uh, my parents could drive into the local gas station, fill up the family car with two silver dollars. And today you can still do that with the two silver dollars at the face, uh, not at the face value, but at the silver content at the market value. Why is it that we can't consider, you know, the two of us an, an option? You love paper money. I think money should be honest, constitutional, it's still on the books, gold and silver, legal tender. Why don't we use it? But why don't we allow currencies to uh, run parallel? They do around the world. I, my, one of my options, uh, you know, as much as I would like to do something with the Fed, I say the Fed's going to self-destruct eventually anyway when the money, when the money's gone. Um, nobody prevents you from holding silver or gold if you want to. It's perfectly legal to do that. Stubborn unemployment rates, a devaluing dollar, and waning trust in government policies is leading to a golden trend. More than a dozen states have introduced laws to recognize gold as legal currency. In 2011, Utah was the first to make it legal to do business using gold. In May, the Arizona legislature voted to recognize gold and silver as legal tender. The reason that gold and silver are the optimum form of money is because of their properties. It's an easy medium of exchange because gold and silver store a large amount of value in a very small area. It's a unit of account. Pure gold has the same value all over the planet. So an ounce of gold buys the same amount here in Egypt as it would in China or in the United States. It's durable. The same gold that Egyptians were using in trade 5,000 years ago is still here with us today. It does not corrode. It's divisible. You can make change with it. It's very portable. You could use something like oil as money. It's just that you can't carry around a barrel of oil on your back. It's Fungible, pure gold is the same wherever it is on Earth. Pure silver is the same wherever it is on Earth. It's limited in quantity. That's the reason that it maintains its purchasing power. Governments cannot print it. Over the last 5,000 years, only gold and silver have maintained their purchasing power. Silver is more rare than gold. To put this into perspective, total above ground available gold in 1950 was 1 billion ounces and today it's estimated to be around 6 billion ounces. Recently, major coin dealers in the US have reported the demand in dollars for silver is now equal to the demand for gold. This means that for every 52 ounces of silver sold, one ounce of gold is sold. But remember, it is a fact that there is less silver than gold. 1950, there are 10 billion ounces of above ground available bullion inventories, giving the world 140 months of silver supply. By 1970, it shrank to 70 months. 1990, 55 months. 2010, 11 months at just over 700 million ounces of above ground available silver. A collapse of 93% in global inventory. Yet demand continues to surge. Despite all the new silver mine, the world has consumed so much silver in the last 50 years. The last time above ground inventory was this low was 1300 AD, and the consumption and uses for silver is accelerating. In 1999, 100 million ounces of silver went to electronics. In 2011, it is projected to reach 250 million ounces. However, the new uses for silver are ever expanding. For example, in 1999, the amount of silver used for solar panels was so small, there wasn't even an official reporting of the number. In 2010, it was 75 million ounces. And by 2014, it is projected to reach 130 million ounces. Investment demand is also on the rise. In fact, in 2010, the U.S. Mint sold 35 million American Eagles, which means that the 4.8% of silver mined in 2010 went to create a single coin. The odds of these coins being melted down are next to zero, as this is the most popular coin in the world. So it is safe to say the silver that was used for these coins is just as gone as the 50 cents worth of silver in your cell phone. 
As the Fed prints and investors begin to flood into the money of gentlemen, relative to the amount of fiat currency, there isn't a lot of silver to go around. New mines in the U.S. and Canada take 10 years from the time of discovery until they can produce a single ounce of silver. In Nevada, the silver state, there is solid evidence that mine production has already peaked. Nevada produced 25 million ounces of silver in 1997. In 2010, production had collapsed by just over 70% to 7.3 million ounces. According to the research done by SRS Rocco, report titled Peak Silver, of the top eight silver producing states in the U.S., all have peaked in production, despite all of our new technologies that have helped us extract the metal. In fact, according to the USGS, the ore grades have collapsed 95% in the past 75 years in the U.S. To put it simply, it is getting harder and harder to mine silver, taking more time and energy, both human and liquid, in order to get silver out of the ground. And I'm keeping my eye on silver. Why? Because I can't get it, at least not the silver coins that I'd like. The 2013 American Eagle silver coins, the U.S. Mint says they are out of them. There's a shortage of those coins because there's such strong investor demand. And why is there this investor demand? Well, a lot of traders say that perhaps a lot of investors are fearful about what's going to happen with the debt ceiling. Here is silver in today's dollars measured uh, with the shadow stats CPI again, the pre-Reagan CPI, and it would be almost 600 bucks an ounce. Uh, with, with the CP lie that the government uses today, it would still be $150 an ounce for that 1980 high. And silver is selling below its 1980 price. There isn't anything else that you can name except maybe computer chips that are selling at a discount to their 1980 price. Silver is still just stupidly low and it's going to rise and here it is measured against paper assets again. We haven't even come anywhere near this equilibrium and because it's been, it got so low here we have to work off that energy. You're probably going to see a super spike in silver that's going to just take everybody's breath away. You'll probably see silver at one-tenth of gold's price instead of one-sixtieth. That means you would get six times leverage over gold buying silver. Now, this is going to happen, and you can only play the hand that you're dealt. But the great news is that gold and silver always end up doing an accounting of the expansion of the currency supplies. Basically, the will of the public and the free markets. When governments do this kind of stuff to their currency supply, they debase it. Eventually, it comes back in inflation. People sense the loss of their purchasing power. They rush back to gold and silver, and they bid the value of the gold and silver up in the country until it meets or exceeds the value of all the currency in circulation. This is a process that's been going on over and over again throughout history, except this time it's happening on a global scale. It has never before happened in all countries at once. And that means that this is the greatest wealth transfer in history. Therefore, it's the greatest opportunity in history, and it's not going to happen again in your lifetime.